Hello, everybody. Welcome to Data Science Day. We are excited to show you what these uh, data scientists came up with today. Uh, we are here at the virtual red carpet. We are waiting for some of the teams to come by. Uh, we're just going to kind of get to see what they're doing. And here we see, uh, we came, we saw, we conquered. Hey, guys, come on in. How are you guys doing? You guys excited? Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. Awesome. Super so, sweet. sweet. Cameron, tell me, what are you the most excited about today? Uh, man, we can't wait to show you some of the visualizations we got for you today. Nice. We're going to be floored. I cannot wait. Uh, let's see, Mr. Jeremy, uh, what, is is your, what, is your, what does your family think data science is? I'm curious. They think data science is counting really high with an abacus and just stats and math and just way over the top. That's what they think data science is. Got it. So they, they got know. it right on board, right? That's exactly what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Uh, Ryan, uh, what, what are they expecting to see? What do you think they're going to see today? I don't know. It's something, something nerdy, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. And what do you guys, what, how are you guys going to celebrate once you guys are done here? Some ribs. Some <laughs> ribs. Okay. Texas ribs, New, uh, St. Louis, which, what, what kind? So I think we're doing some baby backs. Okay. Some baby back. Okay. Chili cool. Special. Awesome. Uh, so we'll kick it over to, uh, to Cameron. Hey, Cameron, in one sentence, describe your project. Right. So city spends $300 million a year on sewers. We want to lower that price by uh, helping them figure out, diagnose, and fix problems before they happen. Awesome. Well, you guys get in there. We'll see you here in a few minutes, all right? All right. That was We Came, We Saw, We Conquered. Uh, we are waiting for the next group. Uh, I think they're coming over here. Uh, here comes Social Record. Hey, Social Record, come on in. Hey, Hi, guys. guys. What's up? Hey. How are you guys? <laughs> good. We're good. You guys excited? <laughs> yeah, uh, super excited. Awesome. Sonny, tell me, what are you the most excited about today? I'm excited. Uh, uh, we can show everybody our work and uh, our families are doing together. Cool. Speaking of families, Brandy, uh, what, is your, what does your family think data science is? They probably think it's just playing with Excel and, and doing a lot of magic with numbers. <laughs> magic with numbers. I like yes. that. And that. They have to be right, right? Like you guys are going to do some magic with some of these numbers. That's how it feels for me. I think I've described it like that a few times. <laughs> Uh, Yvonne, what do, you think they're, what, what do you think they're expecting to see? Huh. I don't think they know what they're expecting to see because they don't know what data science is. <laughs> uh, so we'll see. Cool. Uh, Ms. Jada, uh, what are you going to do to celebrate once this is all over? Sleep. Sleep? sleep some more and then sleep some more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so then on, on that note, uh, Yvonne, what do you get? What do you think you're going to be doing tomorrow? What does tomorrow look like for you? Sleep. <laughs> sleep and just eat and watch Netflix all day and just not think okay. about anything. <laughs> okay. Unless you get some interviews and I need you guys awake and make, going through that process. So yes, Netflix I'll make an exception for those. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ms. Brandy, uh, who, who are you wearing? What, uh, what, what kind of dress is that? This is totally Gucci. <laughs> totally Gucci, of course. I would, I would expect nothing less. Uh, perfect. I only have one more question for you guys. Let's throw this one over to, uh, to Jada. Jada, in one sentence, uh, describe your project. Our project is a fairly detailed analysis of how social factors can affect COVID cases in Texas. Perfect. You nailed it in one sentence. I love it. Well, guys, go ahead. Go on in. Uh, we cannot wait to see what you guys present. And uh, good luck, all right? Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Thank you, Social Record. We cannot wait to see what you guys present here in a few minutes. Uh, yep. No, that's exactly who I think it is. Uh, now we have data and urban development coming in. Hey guys, come on in. Hey everybody. All right. Hey guys. How's it going? It's on. You can't go outside without me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay. Don't mind my son. He's a little boy. That's exactly, yeah, that's, that, that's how they are. You know, that means you're doing it. That's, you're doing a great job. Uh, welcome to data science day. Are you guys excited? Oh, very. Yeah. So excited. Oh, no, tell me, what are you the most excited about? Um, uh, doing, the, doing my presentation, just seeing, yeah. seeing, seeing everything. Okay, Nick, uh, let me ask you an interesting question. I've had some good answers to this. Uh, what does your family think data science is? Are you talking about me? Yes, you do. <laughs> Sorry, like nobody, all right. Well, nobody, like, nobody understands it. Like, this is something, like when I had to explain it to my dad, I'm like, hey, I'm taking, I'm stopping work. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm going to dedicate the next six months to this. He's like, what the hell is that? And I said, I don't really know. But 
it's apparently data is going to be like the next oil. So I want to get in now. So that's kind of what, uh, what, what spawned the whole thing. And he kind of understood once I said oil, cause he was in oil and gas. He's like, Oh, I get it. Go for it. So that's all okay. I know. So you're going to get real greasy. I get it. Okay. Perfect. Um, uh, Alec, what, what do you, what is your family expecting to see? What do you think they're waiting for? Uh, probably a job. They would, they just want me to get hired. They're tired of me mooching off them. So that's, that's what I imagine they're expecting to see. I love it. That's exactly what they should expect. That's what everybody that's walking through this uh, door should expect. Uh, Daniel, um, tell me, what are you going to do to celebrate? It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult not to wake up in the morning, get on a Zoom call, and then just be on a Zoom call all day. I think my initial plans is to watch all three extended editions of The Lord of the Rings back to back. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see it from there. That, I don't know how you do that. I tried to do that for like <laughs> minutes and I, that was enough for me. Uh, so you're better for it. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, what is that all? Skip the parts with Frodo. Move, move <laughs> faster. All, all it's, Peter. It's, it's either that or all 28, 27, however many Marvel movies they are. So it's about the same amount of time. It's just different number of movies. I did that towards the end of the year last year and oh my God, it was intense. Uh, <laughs> all the do not recommend it. Also, skip the Thor movies. All right. <laughs> I heard Ragnarok was pretty good. Ragnarok was good. All right, fair enough. I love Noah's uh, like, you know, his little, uh, movie summaries. Skip those and you'll be fine. Uh, awesome, guys. Well, uh, my Roomba's going. So that's how you know this is live. Uh, Mr. Danny, I've heard that you're the stylish one of the group. What are you wearing today? Uh, today, I'm wearing a little, little piece by Nick Joseph, actually. It is bespoke made two buttons uh, it was in the scene of a very famous movie actually it was in 12 angry men awesome you kidding me really all nine dude alec tell me what are you gonna do tomorrow when this is all done what are you doing tomorrow uh, i think i'm gonna smoke a nice cigar and sleep in that's probably what i'm gonna do Love it. Noah, you get the last question. Uh, in one sentence, uh, pick your, uh, just pitch your project in one sentence. So uh, we tried to, or we actually successfully uh, modeled uh, historical housing data, multifamily housing data, data and predicted uh, housing booms in different uh, metropolitan areas. Awesome. We can't wait to see it. Uh, that's it, guys. Get in there. Go and get in that room, and we cannot wait to see what you guys uh, present here. So good luck. Right. And we'll see you just happy to be Bye, here. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day. Take care. Go Spurs. All right. Data and Urban Development, thank you guys so much for stopping here at the red carpet. We have one more team, and I think I see them coming in here. We, now uh, we have ICU Survive. Come on in, guys. You guys ready? What's up, everybody? Oh, let's go. Let's Data go. Data Docs in the house. Data Docs in the house, baby. So you, so you guys are not excited whatsoever. I get it. Okay, cool. Uh, awesome. Well, welcome, welcome to Data Science uh, Day, guys. I know it's been a long journey for you guys, so uh, hopefully you guys are excited. Um, let's, let's kick it off to Shay first. Uh, Shay, what are you the most excited about? Oh, man. Uh, moving forward or about the presentations? Both. Both? Oh man, I'm excited to hear everybody else's presentations as well give our own. They're fantastic projects. But I'm looking forward to what's next and actually being able to do more data science stuff for personal projects moving on. Awesome. Uh, Alan, um, curious. Uh, I've gotten some really good answers from this from, your other, uh, from the other teams. Uh, what does your family think data science is? $80,000 a year, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I love it. Uh, but let's see, go kick it over to, to, to Chase. Uh, Chase, what, what is your family expecting to see when, when, they're, when you tell them you're going to be doing a data science day? What are they expecting you to, uh, to see? Don't tell me about the project, but what are they expecting? Are they expecting magic? A, a bunch of stuff they don't understand, I think. Just a bunch of words and graphs and things on the screen that they flat out don't understand. I think that's what they're expecting the most, yeah. I got it. Uh, Ravinder, this question is for you. Uh, what are you going to do to celebrate when all this is uh, said and done tonight? Throw a big party with 100 people coming in, no social distancing. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, awesome. This question was uh, directly brought up by the Code Up staff to ask to Chase. We've asked it to the other teams, but Chase, 
tell us, who are you wearing? What are you wearing? Uh, what, what, what shirt is that? Are you wearing some Gucci? Are you wearing something crazy? Tell us what your tell us well, about your outfit. By request from the great uh, Stephen uh, Solis, he actually gave me the biggest. Uh, you know, he gave me a lot of guff for coming not dressed properly to so many video calls that I I thought today I would come ready to go in a Target original. Uh, I don't know what brand they have at Target. I don't know. This is probably Massimo or something like that. So I'm really excited. So Stephen, I hope I look good just for you, buddy. Just for you. I think it's called Target. That's how you make it. Target. It's my man Target. Target. Check out the, uh, yeah. There we go. Uh, Alan, I'll throw one to you. Uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? What does tomorrow look like for you now that this is going to be done? Well, uh, I've been waiting for my wife to join my uh, graduation, but since her flight got canceled over four times, uh, she'll be here around the day after that. So I'm so looking forward to pick her up at the airport and, uh, you know, see her and then tell her the good news about me grad getting graduated. Awesome. Perfect. Well, hopefully she comes in safe. Uh, yeah. Sorry for all those uh, those delays, but I'm sure she's going to be happy to see you. Uh, and finally, you. Mr. Che, uh, tell us in one sentence, what is your project about? We're predicting if patients survived or didn't survive in the ICU. It's pretty straight simple. <laughs> It there sounds morbid, but it's actually a lot more a lot more to it than you would think. All right, perfect. Well, guys, uh, we're excited to see what you guys have to present. You guys get in there. We're uh, we're gonna get started here in a few seconds. So good luck. Say goodbye to everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 See you in a minute. <laughs> All right, everyone. That is the end of the red carpet. We are excited to show you these presentations. So now I'm going to kick it over to uh, Jason Strawn, our CEO for a quick little message. Uh, please enjoy, get your wine, get your milk, get your water, whatever you wanna have there for a beverage uh, and enjoy the show. So Jason, over to you. Hi there, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jason Strawn and I'm the co-founder and CEO of CodeUp. For the past five months, these 16 graduates have been training full time to become talented data scientists. Our cohorts are named after influential scientists, and this group we named Curie, after the physicist Marie Curie. Each of these graduates has grown to love and excel at what they do, and we hope that you'll be able to pick up on that as you watch their capstone presentations. Thank you again for being with us. Now here's Dimitri to discuss what data science is all about. Thanks, Jason. Hi, I'm Dimitri, the Vice President of Delivery with Coda. If you're new to us, we are an immersive 22-week career accelerator with programs in software development and data science. Rather than sitting through hour long lectures twice a week, our students have been building skills, practicing data science, and deriving insights from real world data every single day from nine to five. They engage with data wrangling, statistical analysis, model development, reporting their findings, and more for over five full months. To give you some more background, data science is the use of math and stats, computer programming, and domain expertise to drive actionable intelligence from data. To ensure our grads can add value to your company from day one, we built our curriculum with feedback directly from over 30 hiring partners and practitioners. So we focus on what companies actually need. Our curriculum develops expertise throughout the entire data science pipeline, from project planning and data acquisition, all the way to modeling and delivery. The final result is a versatile, scrappy, and experienced data science generalist who's comfortable with real, messy data proficient in modern data science tools, and is ready to add value to your organization. As you watch the capstone presentations, make note of the names that you think will be a great addition to your team. So you can go check them out on our alumni portal where we have resumes and contact information. Without further ado, welcome to Curie Data Scientist Day. In the capstone projects you're about to see, our students have discovered key insights through data analysis, machine learning model development, and data visualization. Each team began this process by identifying a problem in an area of interest, forming a hypothesis, and determining stakeholders, including several real clients. From there, our groups of four worked as full-time data scientists to deliver key insights, takeaways, and recommendations in just 10 days. And they did this entirely remotely, utilizing Zoom for daily scrum meetings and virtual Kanban boards. Our first group did not disappoint. Here's team, we came, we saws, we conquered. Hey everybody, my name is Jeremy Cobb. Our team name is We Came, We Saws, We Conquered, and our project is Preventing Sewer Overflow Events. Here is an introduction to everyone who worked on our project and the presentation. To the far left, we have myself, Jeremy Cobb, then we have Cameron Taylor, David Wedderschant Sr., and then Ryan McCall. 
Next is a rundown of everything we're going to discuss during today's uh, presentation. First, we're going to go into an introduction to San Antonio's water system. Then we're going to go into our executive summary, talk about where our data came from, what questions we asked the data, what factors from our analysis are valuable, how we made our predictions, how our machine learning model works. Then we're going to go into our recommendations and then finally our conclusion. So San Antonio's water system, why is it important? Well, between the years of 2006 and 2011, the Environmental Protection Agency recorded over 2,200 illegal sanitary sewer overflow or SSO events. These 2,200 SSO events resulted in over 23 million gallons of raw sewage spilling into our local waterways. This affects our community with raw sewage ending up in our drinking water sources, and also when an SSO event occurs, raw sewage would dispense into our streets, ending up in our yards, potentially in our homes, and physical contact with raw sewage leads to a higher risk of gastrointestinal illnesses. In 2012, San Antonio paid $2.6 million in civil penalties to resolve these various environmental protection agency violations. And in 2013, San Antonio agreed to a $1.1 billion budget in accordance to the Clean Water Act of 1972 to upgrade our sewer systems. With these upgrades scheduled to come to a completion by 2025, San Antonio is now allocating over $300 million a year in operations and maintenance of our sewer systems. So, how can we predict why a sewer incident happens? We take drivers such as rainfall, sewer maintenance, sewer age, and the temperature of the weather. We use it to predict root causes of sewer incidents that are found in the data. These root causes are things such as structural damages, uh, liftgate malfunctions, and a grease block pipes. We explore our features, we ran statistical tests, and what we ended up with was a decision tree classification model that had a 41% improvement over our baseline predictions. What we want to do with this model is present to SAWS to help them take preventative measures before uh, more problems occur. We also want to use it to help San Antonio's water system have a faster diagnosis of sewer related issues. Now, going into the acquisition portion of our presentation, let me introduce Cameron. Thanks, Jeremy. We got our data from a few different places. First, we got the Sanitary Sewer Overflow, or SSO, data from SAWS itself. This included just under 3,200 different SSO events. Next, we pulled in weather data from the NOAA. This was gathered at San Antonio's International Airport and was gathered between the years 2009 and 2019. Next, we pulled in 311 call data from the City of San Antonio. 311 is a service that allows residents to make calls to complain or ask questions about the city. So once we had our data, we had to join it together before we could use it for exploration. First, we were able to join the sewer and weather data by aggregating over days and then joining on the date of the SSO event. Next, we used a Python module called GeoPy that allowed us to extract zip codes from the street addresses that we were given with the SAWS data. SAWS only collected street number and street name rather than additional location data that we felt would be useful, but we'll talk about that later. On the right, you can see a map of the city of San Antonio that shows the most common root cause by zip code. Now, once we used GeoPy, we actually noticed that about a third of the results we were getting back were unusable. So rather than joining that together and losing a third of our data, we felt it would be better to keep as much data as possible and not use the 311 data at all. Next for exploration is David, take it away. Thank you, Cameron. Like Cameron said, we had our data. So what do we do with it? Well we were now able to begin exploring. So what questions did we ask? For the NOAA weather data, we had questions such as, are SSO events triggered by the amount of rainfall? Or, does temperature trigger SSO events? For the sanitary sewer overflow or SSO data, is the age of a sewer something that can be used to predict SSO events? Combining and using these data sets, we were able to statistically confirm our hypotheses and then visualize our findings. Quick note, for the next three slides, our visualizations x-axis or bottom axis is each of the most common root causes. Our y-axis is what we evaluated as a predictor for SSO events. Like I said, with our data now combined, we were able to ask questions such as the first one we ask here. Is rainfall a relevant predictor of SSO events? The y-axis or vertical line on the left side here is the amount of rainfall in inches. Notice that following the y-axis of each swarm plot, the shapes are relatively uniform with the exception of the highlighted events. Since each little dot represents an SSO event, we can see that lift stations malfunction more often when it rains heavily. <laughs> and surprisingly, rain damages, well, they're more probable when it rains. 
The next question we ask, is temperature a relevant predictor of SSO events? We are now looking at temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. We can see that the data is pretty uniform, so temperature is not a good predictor of root cause. A final question we ask, is age of a sewer a relevant predictor of SSO events? We are now looking at age of sewer in years. We see here that relatively low occurrences of failures in sewers between 15 and 20 years of age for debris, rain, and grease contrast with the higher occurrences of failure in lift stations, narrowing down the likely cause of an event. And in this visual, we can see that sewers that suffer structural failures usually fail within the first year or after the 20 year mark. And with all this information, we can tell that age makes a good predictor. I will now be followed by Ryan to walk us through our model. Thanks, David. So how do we make our predictions? Well, in this case, we decided to go with decision tree classification, but how did we choose this? Well, first we created a baseline model that predicts that every single event is caused by structural failure because it was the most common out of our 11 root causes. It had a 39% occurrence, which means that model would have a 39% accuracy. We then tested several different models, like the decision tree classifier, which asks yes or no questions of the data to classify the event, a random forest, which is several decision trees stacked on top of each other, and k-nearest neighbors, that takes an unknown data point and compares its proximity to known data points to classify the event. We then picked the best model based on its performance on unseen data, and that was the decision tree classifier, because it offered an improvement of 41% over the accuracy of the baseline. Now, how does our model actually work? Well, here is a diagram of our actual model. And you can see, even if we zoom in on this top part up here, there's a ton of information and it gets quite complex. So let's simplify it. Here, we're gonna look at a snapshot of just some of the decisions that our tree makes. First, it asks a question like, was there more than half an inch of rain that day? If there was, the root cause was most likely a rain event. But if not, did the event involve something other than a sewer pipe? If it did, then it was probably lift station failure. But if not, is the sewer older than 36 and a half years old? If it is, then it was probably structural failure. But if not, is it a non-gravity sewer? If it is, then it was probably grease buildup. But what can we do with that information? Well, we can actually construct these checklists here that show us distinguishing features of each of these root causes, and then apply that information to new sewers. Take this sewer right here, sewer number 13. We have several pieces of information about it, and we want to know what it's most at risk of suffering. So first, we're going to look at its age. At 40 years old, that puts it most at risk for structural failures. With a pipe diameter of 42 inches, that puts it again at risk for structural failures. With a pipe length of 350 feet, it's at risk for structural failures and rain events. And it's a siphon type sewer, which puts it at risk for structural failure and grease buildup. Now with that information, we can clearly see that it's most at risk for structural failures. And now SAWS can apply an action plan to the sewer to treat it for future structural failures. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Cameron to take us through our recommendations. Thanks, Ryan. First, we felt that if we had more complete location data from SAWS, we could use it to build an even better model. For instance, if we were able to join in 311 data on zip code as we originally intended, we would be able to use additional features such as the amount of calls that came in in a given zip code and the response rate to those calls. Next, we feel it's important to use all of the sewer data rather than only the sewers that have already experienced SSO events. If we had this additional data, we would actually be able to create a model that could predict when an event might occur rather than only why it did. Finally, we feel it's important to implement our model to develop a playbook of sorts that uses our model's output to prioritize maintenance and upkeep of the city sewers. With these recommendations in mind, these are the next steps we feel should be taken. First, developing the playbook implementation. Second, gathering all of the sewer data. Third, including the 311 data. And fourth, creating the on-site diagnosis checklist that Ryan talked about. Finally, present all of this data to SAWS itself so hopefully they can implement it and save our city some money in the future. We actually will be presenting our data to SAWS in the upcoming CivTech Datathon. This concludes our presentation. If you have additional questions or want to reach us, we have a link to our CodeUp alumni page and our project repo on GitHub, as well as our personal profiles on GitHub and LinkedIn. Thank you all very much. Our data science curriculum strives to build adaptable professionals. We don't just teach statistics, MySQL, Python, and various other tools. We also teach our students how to learn and approach new problems with perseverance and self-reliance. 
That way, they can use whatever tools they have to create meaningful solutions. We could just give them the fish, but we'd much rather teach them how to fish themselves. And while we're at it, we teach them how to hunt and how to forage so they can adapt to whatever problems come their way. This adaptive expertise is often referred to as learning agility, one of the most highly sought after qualities in the tech field. As you watch our next presentation, pay special attention to how this group turned a problem into an innovative solution. Here's team social record. Hello. Thank you for attending this presentation of our Texas COVID-19 vulnerability analysis. Let's get started. Our incredible team consists of myself, Jada, Yvonne, Brandy, and Wen Liang. Each of us pulled from our domain knowledge to contribute to a unique point of view for this project. That being said, this analysis is not intended for publication in a medical journal, however, it is intended to inspire further research. Although my personal background is in public health and epidemiology, as a team, we worked very hard to ensure all of the methodologies we used are consistent with data science and statistical guidelines. Our findings are based solely on data collected until June 25th, and using that data, we performed a myriad of statistical tests. Today, we'll present to you our most relevant results. So here's our agenda. I'll start us off with an executive summary and a peek at the data. Next up, Wen Liang will talk through some of the social vulnerabilities we discovered. After that, Brandy will show a timeline analysis of how COVID data relates to te Texas state ordinances. Finally, Yvonne will show some of the possible indicators of infection in small counties and then present our conclusions. So we combined data from previously unlinked state and federal sources to study the interactions between social factors and COVID-19. We ended up, after under two weeks of analysis, finding that there are relationships between COVID-19 and minority status, state ordinances, population size, and proximity to either meatpacking plants or transportation routes. Those relationships revealed vulnerabilities in counties that have a higher infection percent and are less obvious in counties that simply have a high number of cases. And we'll discuss why that's important in a bit. So now let's take a look at the data. We compiled about 30 plus files from the CDC, the USDA, the Texas State Department of Health and Human Services, and we used Google Maps and the USPS to link them all together. Our data wrangling process consists of four steps, starting with compiling all of that data into one place, then using Python to clean and prepare it by filling in null values, updating data types, removing anything not pertinent to our analysis, and calculating new fields. Then using Pandas, we converted all of those files into data frames and merged them together using FIPS, which is a uniquely identifiable county code. Finally, our data frame consisted of 254 rows, that's one row for each county in Texas, and 102 columns. Those are all the social factors we wanted to explore. Next up is Wen Liang, who will talk us through some of the social vulnerabilities we discovered as a result of statistical testing. Thanks, Jada. So during our hypothesis testing stage, we tried all kinds of hypothesis testing to examine relationships between features such as senior citizenship, unemployment rate, minority status, and the county's infection percent. And the county's infection percent is calculated by reported case numbers divided by the total population in a county. We found that the most statistically significant relationship exists between social vulnerability index score of minority status and the county's infection percent. For the minority SVR score, it's defined that the higher the score, the more vulnerable the minority group is. From this chart, especially from the lined green line, we can see minority SVR score is linearly and positively correlated with infection percent, which indicates the higher the minority SVR score, the higher the infection percent. Although such kind of linear relationship is not super strong. In addition, we found that some counties have particularly high infection percent, such as Moore County, which is located at the right up corner in our chart. Interestingly, Moore County's minority SVR score is also super high. 
it's about 0.9, which which means it's pretty vulnerable in terms of minority status. Based on those findings through hypothesis testing, we can draw a conclusion that minority groups are facing high risk to be infected during the pandemic. With being said that, I'm going to pass my time to Brandy for further exploration. Thanks, Wenliang. Now let's look at how executive orders and national holidays have had an effect on the number of cases reported in Texas. In this first slide, we are looking at the number of cases reported each week in the month of March. We notice at the beginning of the month, we have very few cases, but by the end of March, we pass the 4,000 mark. In the middle of March is when the first executive order was passed, but it only warns people to practice good hygiene and reduce the number of public gatherings, so it doesn't really have an obvious effect on the number of cases at this point in time. Now let's move to the month of April. In the beginning of April, Executive Order 14 went into effect, which required all non-essential businesses to close, reduce the capacity of essential businesses, and asked as many workplaces to implement work from home protocols when possible, in addition to other requirements. Local and state governments were consistent in their messaging at first we're warning people of the risk of being out in public and asking people to stay home when possible. These actions are accompanied by a drop in cases for the first half of the month. In the middle of April, we have the Easter holiday, which we have shown as a week due to the average five day lag between exposure and symptoms. The reported number of cases drops during this time. However, we notice at the end of April, cases again begin to rise. This is when we begin to receive conflicting messages from local and state governments, and people begin to agitate to reopening the economy. In the month of May, Texas begins phase one of reopening. This is accompanied by another increase in cases. At the end of April, we have just below 8,000, but by Mother's Day, we have just over 9,000 new cases in one week. We have less new cases in the week following Mother's Day but cases again begin to rise the following week. This rise in cases coincides with phase two of reopening the economy. During the week following the Memorial Day holiday, Texas gains more than 11,000 new cases. This increase in cases occurs at the same time as major protests swept large cities and when many non-essential businesses resumed operations. Now let's move on to the month of June when Texas moved into phase three of reopening the economy. Even though our data set only has data until the 25th of June, during this month, the number of cases doubles from 12,000 to just over 24,000. So now Yvonne will discuss some of the factors unique to individual counties that have impacted these case numbers. Thanks, Brandy. First step, I am going to walk you through the proportion of cases per county. Here we have a quick view of the state as a whole. As you can see, there is a red gradient across the state. This simply means that the darker the red, the higher the infection percent is in that county. Let's take a look at what the top five counties with the highest proportion of cases are. We have Moore County at 4.1%, Jones County at 3.1%, Walker County at 2.6%, Potter at 2.3%, and lastly, we have Titus County at 2%. Now what this means is if we took Moore County, who's sitting at 4.1% and had 100 people, four of them would be likely to be infected with COVID. When we compare that to the county where Houston is, which has an infection percent sitting at approximately 0.5%, they would have less than one person infected out of the 100 people. This is why we chose to focus our attention on the infection percent rather than the number of infected. Now, let's take a look at what some of possible factors for the high rates in these smaller counties could be. First up, let's look at transportation routes. We can see that Moore and Potter County are sitting along I-40, which connects the Panhandle to New Mexico and Oklahoma. Jones County sits along I-20, which connects El Paso to the DFW area. 
Titus County is sitting along I-30, which is used to connect Dallas up to Arkansas. And lastly, we have I-45 by Walker County, which is used to travel extensively between Houston and DFW. Another thing to take note of is truck stops tend to be located in smaller cities along these heavily traveled roads. Since we are so reliant on shipping now, and this doesn't shut down with the economy, these routes are a possible vector of transmission between the larger counties and the smaller ones. Next, let's take a look at where some meatpacking plants are. As we can see up in the Panhandle area, we have a group of three large meatpacking plants, one of which did have an outbreak in May, and we can see that the counties surrounding this area are shaded in a darker red. When we look at the other meatpacking plants across Texas, we don't notice as dark shading, but some of them do have a light pink color. What we found was that minorities are disproportionately affected by COVID. From the CDC, I learned that the national rate of hospitalization for non-Hispanic white people is roughly 44 per 100,000 people. Hispanic people is roughly 193 per 100,000. And non-Hispanic black people is roughly 202 per 100,000. State ordinances seem to play an important role. Small counties lack resources because these tend to be based on the population of the county. We need to look at infection percent as well as infection numbers to ensure all counties stay safe. Both the presence of major transportation routes and meatpacking plants could play a role in aiding the spread of this social disease. Given two more weeks, we would like to analyze COVID-19 in county jails as well as explore a breakdown of infection percent within various age groups. We greatly appreciate your time and thank you for joining us today. Please visit our website, thesocialrecord.com, where you can find an interactive dashboard that will provide you with further insights on all the counties of Texas. Stay informed, stay safe everyone. Thank you. At CodeUp, we don't rely solely on lecture theory and hypotheticals. Instead, we put our students to work with raw data sets of all shapes and sizes, exposing them to ambiguity, outliers, and imbalanced data. We use real, messy data to pair our students to hit the ground running at companies like yours. While many programs rely on theoretical knowledge and pre-clean data sets, our students can actually work throughout the entire data science pipeline from planning, acquisition, preparation, exploration, modeling, and delivery. As you watch this next group, pay special attention to how they acquired and prepared the data. Here's team Data and Urban Development. Aloha everybody, my name is Nick Joseph, and on behalf of the rest of the team at Data and Urban Development, we're thrilled that you could join us for our final CODA project, Region of Boom, where we take a look at all the major U.S. markets and try and see if we can predict which ones are on the cusp of a real economic boom. But let's face it, none of this is fun, none of this is interesting unless you know the people behind it. So let me go ahead and introduce you to our team. We have Alec Hartman, Daniel Guerrero, Noah Melangailis, and me, Nick Joseph. What we're going to do today is actually walk you through the story of the data. A little bit, okay, broad strokes of what happened, a little bit about the tools we used, and then we'll dive into the nitty gritty of the specific problems we faced and how we used everything we learned at CodeUp to get the job done. Okay, so how does all this work? Well, first we had to pull the data, which is publicly available, from the U.S. Census Bureau. Then we set out to see if we could predict which cities were about to see a spike of investment in both infrastructure and new construction. And the end result was amazing. We developed a machine learning classification type model that's 91% accurate against the test data. So what that basically means is like, if you took this thing and deployed it into the real world as it is, you'd be right 91% of the time. Not too shabby, especially coming from nothing. So to frame everything, we have to understand we had a client um, a particular audience in mind, and this was TestFit.io. They're a pre-construction software company whose specific interest, at least for this project, was multifamily housing, apartments. They're looking for apartments. But because of the nature of their business, they have to get in before the boom actually hits or else they lose out. So what we did was we tried to figure out a way to answer the question, where are the sleeping giants and what are they waking up? So let's take San Antonio, for instance. The question would be, should test fit enter the San Antonio market in 2021 and expect any kind of reasonable return by 2023? Well, of course, well, I'm not gonna spoil the ending there, but what I am gonna do is pass the buckle over to Noah because he's gonna explain to you the tools we used and how we use them. Take it away, Noah. Thank you, Nick. 
Our project was built in Python with Jupyter Notebooks running .py scripts and using GitHub for collaboration. First, we web scraped files on the Department of Commerce website to acquire the data. We took that data into a pandas data frame, cleaned, organized, and shaped it into a usable format. From there, we used SciPy to perform statistical tests and visualization libraries in Python to explore the data. For modeling, we used the sklearn library to scale, cluster, and then build predictive models. Finally, we created deliverables in Tableau and Google Slides to present our data. Our data reported high-density multifamily housing for 390 metropolitan areas from 1997 to 2019. The data set had market size, number of buildings, and number of units built for multifamily housing. From this data, we engineered features showing market performance and growth. How do we create a model? Let's get back to our initial example. Our model compares the San Antonio 2021 market to historical data. And from that, we want to make a prediction. But we can't, because we have not defined the different types of markets. We need to label the data to perform supervised machine learning so we can use the actual data to perform the predictions to determine if the market is profitable to enter or not. But before we can do that, we need to answer some questions. How do you define a hot market? And how do you measure it? And that will take us to clustering. Take it away, Alec. Thanks, Noah. Okay, folks, so now that we have some context for our project, the data that we used, and the necessity of labels for supervised machine learning, let's talk about how we arrived at our labels, clustering. Clustering is a method that data scientists use in order to determine groups of alike observations in their data based on their proximity using specific features. As you can see on your screen, we have six clusters denoted by their unique color. The specific features by which we clustered these observations are average units per building and the evolution index. We deliberately chose these features as they relate directly to our stakeholders' research question. How many high-density multifamily structures are being built in the United States every day? As our measure of density, we chose average units per building. Let's talk about the x-axis. As we move to the left, we will observe markets where there are fewer units per structure or lower density. As we move to the right, we will observe markets that are considered higher density or more units per structure. Okay, so now that we've oriented ourselves with our x-axis, let's talk about the y, the evolution index. The evolution index is a market's relative performance in relation to the greater U.S. multifamily housing market. Let's talk about how this works. As we move down our y-axis, we will observe markets that are underperforming in relation to the greater U.S. market. And as we move up the y-axis, we will observe markets that are outpacing or outperforming the greater U.S. market. So let's talk about how these clusters intersect our axes. We defined top performing markets as those that will be considered high density and outperforming the greater U.S. market, those located towards the top and right of our simple representation here. The markets that are, will be considered lower performing are just the opposite of that, lower density and underperforming in relation to the greater U.S. market. So now that we've oriented ourselves with what these clusters represent, let's talk about how we use them. It's important to remember now that each observation is a specific market in a moment in time. The blue dot that you're seeing on your screen is labeled as San Antonio in 2012. Knowing this, we can plot the trajectory of each market as it moves between clusters, profitable and unprofitable alike. At this point, it's important to step into our stakeholders' shoes. Real estate is a long-term game. And we want our stakeholder to be established in a market that is booming two years prior to that predicted boom. We identified markets that were underperforming at one point, and then two years later, were outpacing the greater U.S. multifamily housing market. As you can see on your screen, San Antonio was just this market in 2012 and then in 2014. We applied this logic to the rest of our observations and our data set and created labels in order to identify emerging markets. 
Let's take a look at the real thing. What you're seeing on your screen now is the actual representation of the clusters that we created in our data. We are using the same axes here, average units for building on the X and the evolution index on the Y. You may notice that these axes are now scaled. However, the principles that we established with our simple representation of our clusters still apply. Our top performing markets are going to be up into the right of our graph and our lower performing markets will be down into the bottom left. Each cluster here is again denoted by a specific color. The X's that you're seeing on your screen are the center of each respective cluster. And the red line bisecting this plot is what we labeled the evolution index threshold. This identifies markets that are performing on pace with the greater US multifamily housing market. So now that we have our labeling convention, let's put them to use. Daniel, tell the people what they want. And Jared. Now let's speak up what we've done so far. I'd like to know that it's a phenomenal job of giving you a brief overview of how modeling works. And now that Alec has given you an overview of how we actually accomplish our labels, we're ready to dive deeper into the modeling. So how did our model actually work? We looked at trends and data from 2018 and 2019 to predict what the data would look like by 2021. We then used a classification model called K nearest neighbors. And the way the model works is that it takes our predictions, so for example, San Antonio 2021, and it compares it to all the historical data. And it's actually looking at the relative distance or the difference in value between our prediction and the historical data. In this case, San Antonio is actually closest to the green dots than the red dots, so the model will label it as green. In reality, our model is a little bit more complex. It looks at the market size, it looks at the number of buildings, the number of apartments per building, the overall performance of that market, and the cluster that that city belongs to. And so it actually combines all of these data points together, and it will compare them and their value to the historical data, and look at, the, again, the relative distance. And in this case, the model actually predicts that San Antonio will be an emerging market by 2023. So we recommend a stakeholder to enter this market by 2021. Now, how often is the model actually right? We actually found that by using multifamily housing data, historical data, we were able to get a 91% accuracy. Now, 91% accuracy is truly amazing. And the reason why we couldn't be happier with this result is because this is this result is actually on test data. So it's data that the model has never seen before or was trained in. And this is something that traditionally is very hard to accomplish. So out of 130 unique cities, how many do we does the model recommend test fit enters in 2021? We actually identified 72 model, 72 cities that we recommend test fit enters. You can see them on the map here. However, 72 cities can be a lot. So we further subcategorize these cities into four groups, four prioritization. Our first group is the cities that have a high return on investment. What we mean with this is these are cities that in the next, by 2021, they'll be underperforming the market. However, by 2023, we expect that they will be overperforming the market. In fact, we expect these cities will grow by about $330 million on average over the next two years. Next, we have our medium markets. These are markets that are, or cities that are performing just about the same as the, rip, the overall market. However, again, by 2023, we expect that these cities will be outperforming the market. We expect these cities on average to grow by about $270 million over the next two years. Then we have our stable high, high cities. These are cities that are already outpacing the rest of the market, but we predict that they will continue to outpace the market for the next two years. In fact, we expect many of these cities to continue to grow by about $100 million over the next two years. And then lastly, we have the cities that we don't recommend our stakeholder enters. The reason for this is that these are cities we actually expect will decrease in value over the next two years. Some of these cities will decrease in value by about $330 million, in fact, and so we would want to avoid those. So let's just go over what we discussed in this project overall. Our objective was to, use, was to create a predictive model that could identify emerging market markets so we could help our stakeholder test fit prioritize what markets to invest in 2021. Our findings was that we could use multifamily housing historical data to actually create a model that is 91% accurate. Out of 130 cities, we identified 72 markets that would be profitable for Tesla to enter in 2021, 
and we further identified nine markets or cities that would offer the greatest return on investment, as we believe these cities will grow by about $330 million by 2023. Some further improvements that we would recommend for the project had we had more time was to bring census population data. Given that we're using multifamily housing data to predict, to use, make predictions, if we could also understand how population trends are changing and which cities are growing or getting smaller, we could further enhance the accuracy of our project. And with that, we would like to thank you for, for your attention. We would also like to thank TestFit for the opportunity to work on this project. We have phenomenal time and the code of staff and leadership for the ongoing support throughout this project. If you want to learn more about the project, you, we welcome you to visit the Code of Alarm website, where you can find more projects that my teammates and I have worked on. Additionally, if you want to read, if you want to go deeper into this project, we've linked the GitHub report, where you can find a much more in-depth analysis of all the statistical analysis, modeling, and evaluations that we've done. Thank you. From working in teams to presenting complicated data, communication skills are critical. Understanding data is only half the story. Telling the story that data represents requires an additional skill set, storytelling. This is one of the top desired skill sets we heard from our interviews and also one of the hardest to find. After identifying actionable intelligence, data scientists need to relay their recommendations to other stakeholders, both internally and externally. This skill set is now more critical than ever with much of that communication being done remotely. Our students have the advantage of telling the stories of their data in different formats, in-person presentations, technical report notebooks, and as you see today, digital slideshow presentations. With impeccable communication skills, our final team is excited to share the story of their data with you today. Last but not least, let's watch Team ICU Survived. Hi everyone, our team has done some incredible work building a machine learning model which will predict the probability of survival following ICU care and we are excited to share it with you today. First, we'll cover the amazing team that put this work together. Moving to a high level overview and summary of our findings, then we dive deep into the data, the exploration and the modeling. Lastly, we'll review insights and deliverables. Shay is gonna cover the data and processing, Ravinder is gonna talk about exploration, and Epong is going to review modeling. And I'll bookend us with the summary as well as the insights. But don't let any of the titles below our names fool you. We all worked throughout the entire data science pipeline, from acquisition to modeling and deliverables. Over the next few minutes, we will uncover the work that brought us nearly 7% better performing results than current models used in hospitals and ICUs all around the world today. We'll show you patient trends that we uncovered to improve upon those models. And finally, if you'll look at the chart on the right, those are the capacity and occupancy numbers for ICUs in Houston right now. Like a previous group mentioned covering all things COVID, in situations of 98% capacity, this work would give clarity on patient risk factors and manage patient movement for care. Now, Shay is gonna go through the data. Thanks, Chase. When we started this project, we had some really interesting questions we wanted to answer. In order to answer those questions, we needed data. Luckily for us, MIT has an open source project which contains data from 200 hospitals across eight different countries. This data is information about that critical first 24 hours of patient's time within the ICU. In addition to this patient data, we're also provided with predictions for each patient on their chances of survival. This prediction is made with the Apache 2 model, which has been used in hospitals since 1992. What's great about having these predictions is that we can test our own predictions against them which will let us know if our models are performing above the model that is being used in hospitals today. Our data contains about 91,000 patients. For each patient, there's 185 variables. These variables are basic information like age, weight, and gender, but also includes measurements of the patient's vitals, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and pH level. One of our main challenges in this project was working through the many measurements we have and identifying the patterns and trends driving if a patient would survive in the ICU. Which raised our next big question. What is the distribution in our data set of those who survived versus those who did not? Well, we found that 91% of the patients in our data set survived, while unfortunately, 9% did not. While 91% survival rate is a great thing, it's unfortunately not so great for our modeling. This is called an imbalanced data set, since the thing that we are attempting to predict is heavily skewed towards one side and means our prediction will apply much more significance towards 91% of the patients who survived. We had to keep this imbalance in mind while we were working through our data, especially while handling the missing values in our data set. Let's take a look at that missing data. 
When we first got our hands on our data, we were surprised to find that it was missing 33% of its values. In order to maintain the ability to use the patient data, even if some of it was missing, we needed to fill in these values with averages so we didn't lose too much of our data. However, during this process, we had to pay special attention to the imbalance in the data since we didn't want to accidentally lose too much that was telling us about who was or wasn't surviving. As we handled our missing data, we found something interesting. The missing data itself was telling us a story about each patient. For example, if a patient arrived with a stopped heart, the doctor and nurses are unlikely to record a heart rate. With this knowledge, we were able to turn that missing data into a narrative to provide to our models, identifying the state of the patient throughout their time in the ICU. Now that we've gone over how we got the data and prepared it, I'm going to pass over to Ravinder to share in our exploration of the data. Take it away, Ravinder. Thank you, Shay. Before we start exploring data, it would be helpful to have a high-level picture of the process here. I have two blocks here. At the top, you can see the course a patient takes from hospital admission to the final outcome. That is after the ICU course, either patients recover or maybe doctors could not save the patient. What we are trying to do is to predict the outcome based on the data from the first 24 hour of ICU admission. How do we do it? First, we have to identify the variables and predictors that have an effect on the outcome. We started with the very obvious ones. For example, how old is a patient? Do they have any underlying conditions? How are his vital signs? We explored these variables to see if they impact the outcome, and the chart on the left shows that they indeed do. The survival rate is lower for the patients who have underlying disease versus those who do not. We use these variables, predictors, as the input to our model. And the chart on the right shows that the results we got are comparable to the baseline, which is the existing model used by the hospitals. So how do we improve our model? The next thing our team did was to talk to MDs, nurses and ICU, ICU techs to better understand the data and dive deeper into the human physiology. Diving deeper, we started to explore other important physiological markers which are more relevant to the patient in ICU. For example, pH level, lactate level, blood urea or nitrogen level, oxygen saturation, and so on, to identify better predictors. As you can see in the charts here, although there is a considerable overlap between the values for the patients who survived versus who did not, there is still some separation and the outliers which can serve as better predictors. One more useful thing we did was to combine different variables to create more insightful features. For example, we tried to identify most critical patients by looking at those biological features which provide insight into their condition. A low pH level, high lactate levels indicate that the patient is very close to that thin line which separates life and death. Additionally, we tried to make a new variable which is based on perception of the medical staff about the patient condition. That is, which tests were run, which tests were not run because they thought they were not needed. And these new features turned out to be pretty useful for modeling and now Alan is going to talk about that part. Thank you, Ravinder. Now we're going to talk about how we measure our predictions. We have a very small portion of positive cases, and the cost of a wrong prediction is critical. In order to reduce the overlap of positive and negative cases, we use the scoring system naming ROC AUC score. As you can see, the graph on the left, the red and blue bumps are the distribution of positive and negative cases. The less the overlapping of the positive and negative cases, the more the curve going to the up left corner of the graph on the right side, which indicates a better prediction. With the awesome work our team did in creating some new measurements, we managed to use different algorithms to build our model and gradually increase the performance as shown on the chart on the left. The baseline model is the original Apache scoring which is 84%. Our best model on the far right bar increased the score on the all of, all of sample data set by 7% and reached 91%. What does this 7% mean? Our model reduced the number of wrong predictions by 1,623 cases over the original Apache score system. Not only do we want to make better predictions, but also we want to know what are the key drivers to make those predictions. We have discovered some of the most important vital signs which in the future doctors could use as a quick tool to screen patients. As you can see, the top 10 vital signs are listed on the graph. The three highlighted vital signs are the ones we created. Now here's the question, how do doctors in the future apply the knowledge our model produces? The model we use is a tree-based model. It looks like the current vital sign, 
Then, based on the order of the vital sign importance, it determines the probability of an outcome or moves to the next vital sign. For example, our model first used the critical condition vital sign, and based on the values, it moved to the next level. And to see whether the patient has either a cardiac arrest or brain hemorrhage, then based on data from those conditions, our model determines whether the patient is going to survive or move on the evaluation of other vital signs to further determine the outcomes. Now Chase is going to cover some insights and recommendations. Thanks, Yipeng. Now, what can be done with the work our team has produced? First, like he said, we need to go a step beyond just better predictions. Our model can provide a per patient risk assessment, giving physicians and clinicians the ability to visualize underlying risk factors for patients and better analyze where they're headed. As Ravender mentioned, in our conversations with hospital stakeholders, ER techs, and doctors, we spoke with them about the identification of two key patient groups. The first is obvious, the high-risk patients. But that second group, we can utilize our model to identify unexpected outcomes where patients had a negative expected outcome, but they recovered, or the opposite. This would give them an opportunity to assess each case to improve the outcomes of the possible patients regarding recovery, as well as possible mitigations on the negative ones. And as Shay mentioned, the data originated in an open source fashion from MIT. So in the same way, we invite you to take a deeper dive into our data using the website that we created. There, you'll find this deck with an accompanied appendix with all the tools and data science techniques we used. You'll find the recording of this presentation and a more in-depth one if you're into that extended cut version. Also, you'll see interactive charts so you can explore the data yourself, a link to the project GitHub so you can review our code and more. We invite you to do all of this because a project like this matters. Once again, from all of us, thank you for your time. And please let us know if you have any questions. And there you have it. That wraps up today's Capstone presentations. Thank you to everybody for joining us and watching the hard work our graduates have put in. To our employer partners, be sure to jump over to alumni.codeup.com to find resumes and contact information for those candidates you picked out. Or you can stick on for a couple minutes and watch a short video of our students reminiscing about their time in the program. To our friends and family, be sure to keep watching because after the video, we'll have a private graduation celebration. Thanks everybody. Memory at Code Up is anytime Zach has to give a live coding demonstration and he does this to simulate typing, that's probably my favorite memory. Every moment I, we, when we were in, in, in person, I enjoy every moment of my Code Up uh, moments. My favorite memory is when we went to the Panaderia and had lunch all together and basically just hanging out with my classmates. That was the like going on walks with my cohort and just finding my people. Just, yeah, that tribe feeling. <laughs> my favorite memory was actually right at the very beginning. We had a one-on-one -on -one with our desk partner and uh, uh, I actually became pretty good friends with that partner and uh, just being able to get introduced to these people from all, all walks of life and, and all these things that, that we never would have met otherwise. It's a good experience. Honestly, my favorite memory, and there was a bunch of them, um, but my favorite memory was a point where Maggie told us that we were now at a point where we were better data scientists than any data scientist she had interviewed or hired. Favorite memory was probably when there was a day in class we're known for putting puns in the chat in the middle of teacher's lectures. We'll just throw jokes out at each other. And there was a day in class when Zach realized he missed like 38 messages inside of the chat. And he just says, you know what? I'm not even gonna check it. You guys just put puns in the chat anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that was best memory. There's a, I have a ton of great memories from Code Up, and, but the one that sticks out the most is it's weird because it has nothing to do with technology but it was just how hot and bothered my cohort member uh, Chase, Chase got uh, when he was, somebody was talking about poaching eggs and he flipped out and said that you don't poach eggs, sorry, he said you don't poach, e the way you poach eggs is that you bring the water to a simmer, you stir the water and then you drop the egg in. If anybody tells you to add vinegar to the water, that is blasphemy.
And so, I don't know, just like you never know what they're going to talk about. And so whatever stands out is stuff that just is so random and abstract that I just couldn't, I couldn't write that in a screenplay. So um, this happened like just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were in the middle of a lesson that Zach was teaching and, you know, all, all year long, we've considered him kind of like a wizard where he just types out like line after line of like amazing code. And uh, he got stuck on something and he moved over to a util file. And all of a sudden I realized that he didn't have all this stuff like memorized off the top of his head. He was like stealing it from a file he'd already written. And it was kind of like, oh, you know, like he's not, I mean, he's still a wizard, but he's not like as much of a wizard as I thought he was, I guess. Or he doesn't, he hasn't memorized all of pandas. Like this was my, my response. But... Um, the past few months have kind of been a blur. And I don't know that I have one specific favorite memory, but I would say just being at Code Up in person and eating lunch with my classmates and uh, just enjoying getting to know each other um, outside of the, the classroom was a lot of fun. Maybe uh, a distinct memory was learning Seaborn whenever Zach taught that. Um, I just loved playing with the visualizations and I, I remember that day being especially sunny and it was a Friday afternoon whenever we were learning Seaborn and the energy in the room just felt like really fun. Um, so I, I would say just uh, my favorite memory is more ambiguous. It's more of just the energy of the classroom that um, was my favorite memory. Um, and I miss that. Memory of Code Up was probably when we built our first Python app. It was a, we had to build a banking app, very basic banking app, which you could basically record some fictitious money and then you could withdraw as much money as you wanted, the dream. And, but it was my favorite memory just because it was kind of the first, I think, thing that we ever created that you could actually like see it working on your computer and you actually understood how it worked. And that's kind of when things started clicking for me. We're like, wow, we're actually learning a lot of stuff. And like, that was like after the first month. So it was just really exciting and like really cool to like build something that quickly. The most memorable memory I have uh, here in Coda was the first day I came because I flew half of the earth to San Antonio. I, I, at that time, I didn't know anybody. I, I was living in a hotel and I, I got, I, I go to school, I go to school the next day I landed on San Antonio. So it was a pretty rush. But the moment I stepped into the class, the instructors and the, all the classmates so friendly and welcome me, it makes me feel like home instantly. That's the most mem memorable part of the days that I have in Coda. My memory of Coda is coming in on that first day and I was still unsure of whether or not I had been scammed out of my money because it just seemed too good to be true. And seeing everybody, all the staff, super excited and smiling, I was for sure like, oh man, I've, I've been scammed. And then we got into that first day and it was fantastic. And uh, it was an immediate like punch in the face, just going and going after that. So it was uh, my first first memory of Code Up is my favorite, just because everything after that was just awesome from me from that point. My favorite memory, uh, I, you know, I don't I don't know if I have a favorite, but I will say a strong contender for favorite memory is the first time we saw Steven barreling down the hallway like towards our room uh and the look on kind of like everybody's face is they were just like oh no here comes steve he's gonna like drop the and he was just like coming to talk to us but we were all just like oh my gosh what is this gonna um that was probably one of my favorites just because it was um a really interesting like tone setting moment um, it was hilarious because um, we were all just like, you know, kind of like cowering a little. Uh, and he's like, why are you guys cowering? Um, so no, that was probably one of my favorite moments because he's just such a fun character. And uh, yeah, it was just a really great tone set for like early on in the program. So uh, my favorite memory is, uh, yeah, just the first day, like meeting all my uh, colleagues and instructors and the code of staff. Uh, I mean, I have made like lifelong friends here uh, and 
truly amazed by uh, the dedication of everyone in the code app. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's the change. That's the day like that I would say changed my life in terms of uh, realizing that I made the right decision coming to the code app. For me, I was so anxious about going into code because I was afraid that it's kind of high school, but I was afraid I wouldn't fit in. I was afraid that I'd go in and everyone would be like these ultra brainiacs and I wouldn't be able to uh, communicate myself or like understand other people They wouldn't understand me. So my favorite memory I think was like day three or day two and we were walking to uh, Geekdom from Code Up. And we were just like, and it's, it's kind of a brisk walk, it's like a half mile or something. And we're just all hanging out and we're all talking and I was like, every single one of these people are like-minded or like me. And that just relieves so much social anxiety so much potential social stress. And I think that was my favorite memory is realizing that I'm in a group of people that are um, kindred spirits and they're like-minded and I was gonna have a great time uh, these next five months. All my friends and family, my mom has been great. All my whole support system has been there for me. Like from the time I was even considering going, Steph, the person who recommended me to go and everyone who helped me get through this process, instructors, my peers, um, I just want to say big thank you to everyone, all the Code Up staff. First of all, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely thank for all my instructors, uh, Ryan, uh, Zach, uh, Maggie, and Fizz for all their hard working and uh, absolutely care for us. And I will also thank for uh, my classmates, especially my uh, teammates for all I worked with for all the uh, awesome work we, we did together and uh, all the help we gave each other. I really appreciate it. I would like to thank my boyfriend who helped me with everything, did all the dishes, kept the house clean, took care of the dog while this was happening so that I could focus all my attention on the schoolwork. The staff, the teachers, like especially Zach and Ryan and Maggie, like they were super great and then Faith, just anytime I felt like I didn't know something, she was always there in your corner rooting for you. And then obviously like my family and friends, but definitely the staff. I'd like to thank my parents, because uh, I've been living with them this whole time. <laughs> I know they'll be stoked to get me out of the house as much as I'm excited, excited to get out of their house. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my friends, uh, my, my friends at church, uh, Cody, Edder, um, Matt, uh, some other people um, for just putting up with me and being open to listening to me talk about math and stats um, when they're like, just shut up, bro. Like, stop telling me all this crap that I don't care about. But yet I'm just like unrelentingly just trying to <laughs> to vacate, vocate uh, what I've been learning. Um, so I just want to thank those people, basically. Yeah. The instructors, for sure. Um, I want to thank Ryan, Maggie, and Zach. They've all been absolutely stellar at their jobs at helping us when we need it. Just amazing work that they do. Thank you all very much. I would like to thank my wife and kids, so my family and my family in San Antonio, my mom and brothers. I like to thank the instructors because they've been incredible, and then also my cohort, all, all my my classmates. It just everybody has been awesome. It's been a great experience. I want to thank my mom for the support that she's given to me, talking to me, and everything throughout the program. Uh, to my in-laws for letting us live in their house during this whole thing. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. We super appreciate it. Uh, to the instructors for all of the stuff that they have taught us. They have completely changed my life and they don't even know how much I am thankful for this experience. And to the rest of the students in the uh, class for just making this the most awesome experience uh, ever. Of course, the Code of staff, everybody from beginning to end has been awesome. But uh, I think the person I'd like to most thank for this whole experience has been Ryan Orsinger. Um, like the guy is, like, he's the one that I had to, I had to code, I had to live code in front of him before, before I got accepted into CODA, into the data science program. And it's not, it wasn't necessarily my strong suit, but what he did was he saw how I thought and he really took, I feel, you know, with the admissions process and everything being as stringent as it is, I feel like he took the biggest risk in getting me into this program. And I just want to thank him because this this has been something where I can kind of replan my life, uh, my life force. And this was a big aspect of it. He was, yeah, he was, was hands down a, a big part of how I got in here. Oh, there's so many people to thank. First and foremost, my wife. 
who has been had to teach my daughter and work while I was in class uh, during all this home time, and she was amazing and patient and incredible. Uh, but then, of course, all the instructors who you know, offer so many different um, experiences and different strengths uh, to kind of guide us through this process, as well as the uh, cohort, which was just a constant uh, supportive and fun and incredible environment. And obviously, code up as a whole for just existing. Yeah, I would like to thank my girlfriend, Steph because she put up with me being in the Zoom call all day. And she was extremely supportive throughout the whole process. The, my parents and my family, they were also very supportive. They were always asking what I was doing, seeing how I could help, and being flexible and kind of, yeah, just very supportive in general, which was always extremely helpful. And <laughs> my roommate, because they also put up with me being in a Zoom call all day from like nine to five while they were just studying. So yeah. People I, I want to thank the most are the people. First, I want to thank uh, all the instructors because of their uh, dedicated work and uh, their, you know, very detailed instructions make this learning process much easier for me. And uh, because I like English is my second language, and they they didn't like, uh, you know, sometimes it makes it a little bit harder for them to understand. But they 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 didn't lose patience. They're very patient with me and they try to. Uh, ask me to repeat the question in, in, uh, until the end of the step, which it makes me feel really, really respect. And also, I want to thank all the classmates. You know, every time I have a question, everybody's so, even though everybody's kind of busy, but they, they're willing to uh, sacrifice their time to help me out. Uh, so, who I would like to thank, I would like to thank all the instructors because um, they really make it a memorable teaching experience, but I specifically want to thank Zach. Because Zach went out of his way to make visualizations that really helped to make some of these really complex top topics actually understandable. And trying to make our own visualizations and learning how to make those made it really apparent that the masterful ones that he made took a lot of time. And they were just really broke things down. So thank you, Zach, for that. In this order, I, I would like to thank the, the, the classmates themselves. Um, for just the ability to take what was already a really strenuous and difficult task of, of taking this program in 20 weeks uh, and then doing it whilst in a pandemic. You know, congratulations and kudos and uh, thank you for all of y'all's effort and continuing to keep me on the path as well. Uh, then obviously the instructor is just bananas, just, just an incredible uh, dedication and you just maintained what felt like being in the class without being in the class, and it was incredible. Uh, and then lastly, obviously, just everyone else that code up from um, the placement team to the marketing team to uh, leadership, obviously. Yes. Um, they just continue to keep the ship, you know, moving uh, and during just tumultuous water, right? And, and, and it's extremely commendable how they managed to do that. So yeah, thank you to everybody. I would like to thank pretty much everyone I have interacted with at code up. Uh, they have gone above and beyond, uh, exceeding my expectations in terms of delivering and making an awesome, awesome experience for all of us. Thank you. Uh, of course, Jason, without him this wouldn't be possible, but um, the instructors especially, um, Zach, Ryan, Maggie, Faith, thank you all for the sacrifices that you made in order to make our experience with Code Up as good as it could be given the circumstances and truly, in my opinion, a, a wonderful experience. Um, learning from you all was a pleasure and I'm looking forward to just what the future holds. Um, so thank you all for everything that you had, have given us, just perspective, uh, and your genuine concern for your pupils. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be a good teacher. It's another thing to be uh, concerned for the well-being of the people who you're teaching. So uh, thank you.